Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming to listen, too. Uh, I can see a few familiar faces in, in the audience and some colleagues as well. So thank you very much for, for coming. What I'm going to call this uh, super bugs but no superheroes uh, because um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about is a global problem, a global health issue that's going to affect us all, uh, but also let you know about what we're doing about it locally. So plenty of superbugs, and, and by that I mean antibiotic-resistant bacteria, but very few superheroes to sort out the problem. Now, if you think about antibiotics, they're very different from any other drugs that we have, and we use them throughout, throughout our lives. We use them to control uh, infection in the early part of life, in the neonatal period. We need antibiotics to control different disorders in, in uh, adolescents and young adults, everything from sexually transmitted diseases uh, to HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis. Uh, certain surgery that's carried out in young people requires antibiotics to prevent infection. Trauma, uh, the sort of thing that young people end up doing to themselves in car crashes, in war, in other uh, incidents, all need antibiotics to control infection. The sort of disorders that young people have, cystic fibrosis, for example, needs antibiotics. Then as we get older, certain other disorders come into play, cancers, heart disease, chest disease, and so on, uh, and um, our, our, the, the mechanics of our body fall apart a bit, so we need orthopedic surgery to control that. None of that would be possible without antibiotics, because you have to prevent infection to allow all those treatments to take place. It's also important to remember that we also globally use a lot of antibiotics in livestock rearing and in agriculture, probably rather more than we should be using. Uh, and the big threat to all of that is the development of resistance. We're hearing about it on the news all the time, but we hear these, you see these uh, dramatic headlines, uh, uh, and again, affecting all ages of, of, uh, uh, of our life. Soldiers coming back from uh, war zones with multi-resistant organisms that are really difficult to treat in our hospital. Uh, and uh, patients with complex diseases at the, uh, at the other end of the spectrum uh, also uh, being treated, be, uh, being infected with multi-resistant organisms. I think it's also very interesting that uh, there may be a few of you in the audience who were born before the advent of penicillin. I think there probably were a few. Um, <laughs> but um, none of us really can actually remember a time before antibiotics. If we were bef born before penicillin, we were probably unaware of, uh, uh, of the need for it. Uh, but it's probably also true to say that antibiotics have saved more lives than any other type of drug. And antibiotics are different from any other type of drug because if you think about it, any medicine you take changes the, your physiology, your metabolism of the human body. Antibiotics are not meant to do that. They're meant to just affect the metabolism of the bacteria, not the, uh, not, not the human uh, body. Now, I think this is a rather striking photograph um, and uh, a rather upsetting one because it's a, it's a Victorian family photograph uh, of two children dressed in black and they're slightly blurred because they've moved around a bit. The only, one, the only one who's in focus is their younger sister who's in white uh, lying on the bed because she's dead. So this is the last portrait of the children of a family uh, and she's almost certainly dead because of an infection because there were no antibiotics. Antibiotics and lack of vaccination killed most children in the pre-antibiotic era. So a very striking photograph, and one clearly which we don't want to come back to. Of all the antibiotics that have been developed over the last 70 years or so, resistance has developed to all of them. In this graph, the green dot is the year that that antibiotic was discovered, and the blue line is how long it took for uh, bugs to become resistant to it. So penicillin, the very first one, for example, first in clinical use in about 1940, uh, staphylococci were resistant to it, causing hospital staphylococcal infections by the late 1940s and early 50s. And that's happened to every single antibiotic that's been pr produced. And there, are, there have been no really new classes, new chemical structures of antibiotics for the last 30 years or so. So we're running out of antibiotics. Why are we running out of antibiotics and why does resistance occur? Well, it occurs basically because we use too much antibiotic. This is pure Darwinian evolution because if you expose the bacteria to an antibiotic, which is the selection pressure, the bacteria will evolve uh, and they can do it in a, you know, in a petri dish in the lab. They will evolve to become resistant. 
Uh, I don't know whether there are any uh, uh, pure creationists in the audience, but I'd love to uh, take you along to our microbiology lab here and show you evolution of bacteria, because you can, it happens in about half an hour. Uh, no time at all. But um, this chart shows that, uh, or estimates, the amount of overuse of antibiotics that we're doing. So approximately 50% of the total volume of antibiotics in the world are used in human medicine, approximately 50% in agriculture. That's a pretty, pretty interesting statistic. And it's suggested that 20 to 50% of all human use of antibiotics is unnecessary. Uh, and 40 to 80% in agriculture and livestock rearing is highly questionable as well, particularly where it's used for growth promotion. So there's plenty of scope for reducing the selection pressure on bacteria. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happened to that slide. It's come out in a funny colour. But the, um, uh, the purpose of this is to show that we... Uh, this is the, these are European countries along the x-axis down here. And you can perhaps guess which one's here. This is the volume of antibiotic use. So across Europe, every country uses dramatically different volumes of antibiotics. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to who uses most antibiotic in Europe? United Kingdom. No. Germany. No. America. No. Greece. This is Greece at this end. At the other end of the spectrum is the Netherlands and Latvia, rather bizarrely. UK comes, comes right down here, almost at the end as well. We're quite good at controlling antibiotics. And yet there is no difference in the incidence of infection. There's no need for this dramatic difference in antibiotic volume use. And as you'll see in some later charts, unless they come out in strange colours, that, the, that in Europe, the biggest resistance problem is in southern Europe, where most antibiotics is, are used. So I'm just going to explain how resistance occurs. Here we've got a very sick patient in intensive care on life support. He's being ventilated because uh, uh, um, his lungs are not working properly. He's, be, he's on uh, um, uh, 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 hemofiltration to help his kidneys, and he's on uh, these infusion pumps are to help his heart as well, help his circulation. Uh, and he, as we all are, are covered in good bacteria, green bacteria, uh, we're all covered from head to foot in normal flora. Now, he's a very sick patient with overwhelming sepsis, so he needs antibiotics, and antibiotics are life-saving. Uh, you'll note down here there's one red one just at the bottom. That's the multiply resistant one, but there's only one of them. But we have to give him broad-spectrum antibiotics because he's really sick. Now, what does that do? Well, it helps cure his infection, but it kills off all the green bacteria along with the infecting ones as well. And the only ones that can survive are these red ones, which start to multiply. And in no time at all... How do I get back there? Oops, oh dear. Goes the whole thing down. That was a mistake, wasn't it? Um, thanks, Andrew. Can we go back? Can we go back one, if at all? Thank you. Um, in no time at all, he's, he's, he's colonised with these multi-resistant bacteria, some of which are getting out into the environment. So they're on the infusion pump uh, and they're on the haemofiltration machine as well. So that, that illustrates the problem we have in hospitals where we have really sick patients who need antibiotics, but equally these resistant germs can get out into the environment and, uh, and cause infection control problems. Now, again, across the world, there's a huge difference in antibiotic use. And in the emerging health economies, particularly in, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, and in the Far East, there's uh, an, uh, you know, a dramatic increase in health technology, and there's a demand for new drugs. Why not? It's the first time they've had them. Uh, and so, for example, there's this Daily Telegraph report from 2010, which shows that patients in China, if you end up going to hospital in, in, in Shanghai, that's what it looks like, so you're going to be in a bed like that. None of the mod cons of, uh, of um, uh, the, the Hampshire Hospital Foundation Trust. But uh, you'll be in a bed like that, and the chances are you'll be given antibiotics. 60% of patients in Chinese hospitals are on antibiotics, compared to 30% in European hospitals or in British hospitals. Uh, and that, of course, in itself fuels the development of resistance. I mentioned Southern Europe, and I'm giving the Greeks a hard time tonight, because uh, although they have the same EU rules as us, uh, you're only, you can only get antibiotics on prescription. That is the law in Greece, as, as well in, uh, as in this country. This study showed that if you go around the pharmacies of Athens, uh, you can get the most broad-spectrum antibiotic over the counter without a prescription uh, between you know, 40 to 60 percent of the time. So most pharmacies are uh, you know, donning it out to whoever wants it. So that's not a good way of controlling a very precious resource. 
And the problem also is that we all travel. We all travel around the world and we take our bugs with us. So this chart shows the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the course of different strains of community MRSA traveling across the, uh, across the globe to Europe. They've all evolved in different parts of the world and they are, they are, are traveling with their hosts to, uh, in this case, to the UK. And we see patients in our clinic, our infection clinic here, with community-acquired MRSA that have come from all different parts of the globe. And these are three, uh, three um, similar patients. Somebody with an infection of his elbow, a bursitis, somebody with a, uh, a boil on his leg, and somebody with a rather nasty infection of their limb. These are all globally acquired uh, community strains of MRSA. So it's very easy to see how these things uh, are being transmitted. An interesting study published this year in Birmingham uh, has looked at the carriage rate, so not infection, but the carriage rate in our guts uh, of a highly resistant E. coli. Uh, and Peter Hawkey looked at this in Birmingham and found that people who were of Southeast Asian origin, who go back to see their friends and families, in the, particularly in the Indian subcontinent, uh, are like 20, over 25% of them are likely to be carrying this highly resistant E. coli, compared to only 8% of uh, people of European origin in Birmingham. Um, now that, that's interesting because all these resistant, or, uh, many of these resistant organisms are evolving at a very high rate in some of these countries where a lot of antibiotics are being used. That's not to put the blame on a particular geographical area, it's just that there are different needs in those countries and we have to be aware of the epidemiology and think of ways of controlling it. And they're traveling. So the problem, is, as I've been trying to describe, is we've got increasing bacterial resistance to currently available antibiotics, and that's caused by the volume of antibiotics that we're using. Oops, I've done it again. But this is a very striking, um, don't worry, no, this is a very striking um, comment, I think, from the chief medical officer uh, in the report two years ago. Uh, because doctors, by and large, want to do the best for the patient in front of them, and often that means giving them a medicine, in many cases, antibiotics. But what the chief medical officer said is every antibiotic expected by a patient, every unnecessary prescription written by a doctor, every uncompleted course of antibiotics, and every inappropriate or unnecessary use in animals or agriculture is potentially signing a death warrant for, for future patients. So that's a really uh, uh, strong message, really, isn't it? So, who's responsible for all of this and what are we going to do about it? Well, we all are, of course. Uh, infection control is absolutely crucial to the success of, of, of any hospital. Um, I, I think we're, we're reasonably good at it. We're, we're not brilliant, but we're reasonably good at it in the UK. Uh, and we need to improve how it's done across the world. So we all need to be aware of what the problem is and uh, how to get around it. So, Simple things are, you know, are, are simple, and, 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 and uh, a very simple message is good hygiene. We're all aware of this. Uh, it's very easy for it to slip the net. But that is a handprint on an agar plate, and each one of those dots represents a single bacteria. So it's a colony of bacteria, uh, and any hand, any, if I did that to any of you in this room, that's what it would look like, because we're all covered in normal human bacteria. If you wash your hands in alcohol or in soap and water, you get what you get the uh, the image on the, on the right there. You reduce the bacterial load. So clearly, you know, hand washing works and is very important, which is why we have all the alcohol gels out everywhere. Uh, and there's one of our sisters uh, doing the business. So very important. And what we try to encourage our staff to do, uh, and we've got, I've got one of my infection control colleagues in the audience. Cheryl spends a lot of her time going around the wall, ensuring that our staff, patients and visitors, do this uh, as often as possible, and certainly between every patient contact. Here we've got a similar thing on an agar plate. Any guesses as to what those rings are? Again, lots of bacteria on them, just to show that doctors aren't perfect. Stethoscope. Stethoscope. So everything we carry around with us can get colonised with bacteria as well. So we need to train our junior doctors and our senior doctors um, to, um, uh, to disinfect their, things like their stethoscopes, their pens, their ties, everything else that we carry around with us. If you just, just wipe your stethoscope diaphragm with one of those little alcohol wipes, no bacteria at all. So if you plonk that on somebody's chest and they happen to have MRSA, and you then go and plonk it on the next patient without, without cleaning it, uh, you may well transmit one of these resistant organisms. But it's all very simple, isn't it? Ah. So I must show that slide because um, that was um, so. So, so that, that's one of the things we're doing is, is, is a lot of work on uh, um, 
on, on, on hand washing and infection control, but also on the environment of the ward. Uh, Donna mentioned that we're putting in some investment into isolation facilities. I'd like to see every patient in their own room with their own facilities. I kind of get shot down whenever I suggest that, because Liz thinks everybody wants to chat in the hospital. They want to be in, the, in their own <laughs> bays. Wants, and some, people. <laughs> some people want to chat. I'm sure there are people in the audience who back me up. You'd like me to talk to. But I'd like to see patients in their own facilities and uh, contained from the infection control point of view. But we, um, where we have patients with infection in the hospital, we need to decontaminate the environment. So I think we're getting better at uh, hospital environment decontamination. But we've also invested, uh, and this has been a wonderful partnership with a local business, with BioQuell in Andover, but also supported by the friends of the hospital in raising some money to purchase these uh, wonderful Dalek machines which spray out uh, high particular um, hydrogen peroxide which penetrates the hospital environment, penetrates the equipment, uh, and eradicates the resistant bacteria. So um, that shows what those, those look like. Um, just to run through very briefly which germs are, are important in infection uh, prevention, um, you, you may remember from sort of 10 or 15 years ago some headlines uh, like this, all relating to MRSA, a Staph aureus. Now, a third to a half of us in this room will carry Staph aureus in our nose. It's part of the normal flora. But MRSA is just one of these, you know, highly resistant organisms selected out by antibiotic use. And we're all aware from these sort of headlines what a problem it was in the health service. These sort of headlines, we all thought at the time, were a bit of an exaggeration. We knew there was a problem there in the health service, but we thought, gosh, the press really go over the top and produce these sensationalist uh, headlines. But actually, what these did was make the Department of Health sit up and think about how they could solve the problem. It made the Department of Health put resources into infection control, which was a good thing. This was the rise in the MRSA epidemic in the UK in the 1990s, and this is the whole of the UK, and this graph represents the, the, the tip of the spectrum of the, ice, uh, the iceberg, the most serious infections in hospitals caused by MRSA. Uh, and at the peak of the, of the epidemic, in about 2000, um, the, the Department of Health said that all hospitals had to report all cases of MRSA bacteremia to the Department of Health. And they then recommended measures that every hospital had to bring into play to improve environmental cleaning, to screen patients, to improve the care of, of intravascular lines and urinary catheters, and all those sorts of things. Um, and um, in about 2003, they introduced targets. And people thought, targets? How can we... How can we have targets for infection? We can't control, uh, control infection in that way. Um, how, how are targets going to work? But actually it did work because it made, it, you know, it made the hospital management say, well, okay, we're going to be fined or we're going to you know, lose kudos if we breach our target. Therefore, we have to put more resources into improving the hospital environment and reducing infection. And across the UK, that has happened. And we've done a lot in this trust to, uh, to do exactly that. Um, you can see in 2002, 2003, uh, we had not a high rate, but we had significant numbers of MRSA bacteremia. Um, we've also had targets. We've met those targets uh, every year until the target came down to zero, which, of course, is unattainable. But you can see in the last two, two or three years, we've had zero, one case, one case. Uh, and so we've really brought this infection uh, and virtually, uh, down to virtually zero and almost eradicated it. We're never going to entirely eradicate it. And you can see here, MRSA across Europe, a big problem still in southern Europe. Spain, Italy, uh, Greece and Romania, high rates of MRSA. And in the UK, it's gone down. In some other countries, it's gone up. Another big problem with hospital bugs is Clostridium difficile. This is a, a gut infection. Again, it's an organism that we all carry in our gut, but if you give broad-spectrum antibiotics, it kills off uh, all your normal flora. This one can overgrow and cause uh, a, a diarrheal problem, Clostridium difficile colitis. Again, this is going up in, in the NHS, uh, and again, the, the measures that the whole country has put in, but we particularly put in in this trust, have brought those rates down. Um, the rates in our trust are here, and you can see, uh, th these just show the rates over the last three years. This is, the blue line is our target, so the target set by the Department of Health. In uh, 2011, we were below that target, so what do they do the next year? They reduce the target uh, down, to, down to that level. So we had 
uh, something like 38, 39 cases in, um, in 2011. So our target for 2012 was 40 cases. Uh, we've managed to just come beneath that target uh, last year, uh, and so of course our target was lowered even further, again to an almost unattainable level. Uh, so we'll have to see how we do this year. But we are, you know, it's, we will always have cases, uh, but hopefully we can we can uh, uh, remain close, if not within our our national target. Um, E. coli, I've mentioned already, but E. coli is the next big problem, the next MRSA. Uh, and it's coming you know, from other countries by and large, but it's, it's also getting into the food chain so that it's colonising our guts. And if we get broad spectrum antibiotics, we may well end up in a, uh, w uh, uh, with an infection with one of these um, multi resistant <laughs> strains. And in 10 years, uh, these E. coli across Europe have become increasingly resistant to common antibiotics to cephalosporins, which are widely used, and to a drug called ciprofloxacin, which is widely used as well. Uh, this is the one that you can get over the counter in Athens, so you can see why, uh, why um, uh, again, the Mediterranean is, is, is in the red there. And, oh, I'm giving Greece a hard time tonight, aren't I? But um, this is another study um, in, in an ITU in Athens where they managed to select out by injudicious antibiotic use and poor infection control uh, an organism similar to E. coli, which is resistant to every known antibiotic. So you can imagine that if, that if, if this spreads across the world, uh, and it'll spread slowly, uh, there is nothing left to treat these. So patients with cancer, you know, who have underlying illnesses anyway, who may need antibiotics and are colonised with this sort of organism, there will be nothing to treat them. So what can we do about it? Well, before we break on to that, and I won't go on for too long, I promise, um, I just wanted to cover some of the other sorts of infections that we deal with regularly. We don't just deal with hospital-acquired infection. This year there has been a whooping cough outbreak, so we've been closely involved both with the diagnosis and the local control of that, and there has been a lot of that in, um, uh, in, in our geographical area. This shows the national figure, and you can see the great peak in 2012. So we deal with community infections as well as, um, as, well as hospital ones, um, and some more unusual infections, but this is one which is a, a real threat, I think, to our hospital trust, is norovirus. Because every year, for the past few years, there have been massive outbreaks in the community, uh, also massive outbreaks in, in organisations, in, in, in uh, uh, care homes, in, uh, on cruise ships, all that sort of thing. And it's really hard to control. So um, one of our reasons for wanting more isolation facilities is so that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, give patients, when they come into hospital as emergencies, isolation straight away and prevent any transmission of, say, norovirus they might be carrying to other patients in the hospital. I think that's a really important thing. So we're working on that. Um, there's been a massive measles outbreak in young people this year. Uh, you, you will have seen something in the press, uh, uh, the, the great increase in South Wales, uh, in, um, particularly around Swansea. Um, I think we've been pretty good in Hampshire, because again, we've been involved with, with local immunisation programmes, and there have only been two cases of confirmed measles in the Hampshire area, because we've managed to get uh, a lot of public information out and increase the, 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 the vaccination rate. So uh, at the moment we've got that under control. And then there are all the unknown infections which may be coming our way, which we have to be prepared for. There's an outbreak at the moment of uh, a, a, a nasty respiratory virus in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's, it's, it's caused about 100 cases in Saudi Arabia with half the patients dying from this respiratory virus. There's been one case in the UK in somebody returning from the Middle East. But uh, you can see this rather dramatic um, uh, prediction here that if, if the outbreak spreads to the pilgrimage in the Hajj, which is due in, in October, then the, uh, the virus could go global. Flu, we've had that several years running and had to deal with different strains of that and how we isolate patients in the hospital as well as vaccinate patients in the community. And SARS and other respiratory virus, which of course came from China via Hong Kong, which uh, caused a, a number of deaths around the world. So we have to be prepared for all of these and, and kind of think ahead of, as to how we're going to to manage those. So a few possible um, solutions to the, the resistance problem, and uh, the future isn't, isn't very rosy and it's not very orange either. But as you can see from this BMJ uh, front page, there isn't much in the way of new antibiotics, and a lot of people are debating how we can stimulate the discovery of new antibiotics. Again, within the trust, we're quite 
intimately involved with the British Antibiotic Society. So we've done local research and we've been involved in, in national guidelines on antibiotic use. Uh, and we've been involved in a campaign, uh, as you see I'm standing here in front of number 10 along with the TV doc, um, Hilary Jones and Professor Piddock, and we're presenting a, a petition to, to number 10 to help facilitate the discovery of new antibiotics through involving government, universities, uh, big pharma industry to come together and to think about ways of developing new agents. Um, the, this is the slogan for the American campaign down here, uh, in which they, they, they call it bad drugs, uh, sorry, bad bugs need drugs, uh, and they're promoting 10 new antibiotics by 2020 but we'll have to see whether that can be achieved. We're also doing research locally on uh, novel diagnostic techniques as well, because if we're using too much antibiotics, it's because we're not terribly good at diagnosing infection often. We want to do the best for the patient in front of us, but sometimes infection is not uh, absolutely apparent clinically. And microbiologically, we're still actually using 19th century techniques. It's horticulture. We still have to grow the bugs on agar plates and do sensitivity testing. So we need to develop better diagnostic uh, methods to identify infection. We've done uh, one project here looking at a molecular technique to try and identify bacteria in patient samples very quickly, uh, and that's looking promising. Uh, and we've also done a project on a so-called biomarker, a blood test, uh, to indicate whether that patient has infection or not. Uh, and this is a, this is a published study. We, we use this to help us make a decision as to whether patients needed antibiotics. So of 99 patients coming into the medical emergency unit, they had this blood test. They, no, we weren't quite sure whether they really had an infection or not. They had some signs, but it wasn't clear. When the, this particular um, uh, uh, molecule in the blood was low, we didn't give antibiotics. If it was high, we did give antibiotics. Uh, and in no case in these 99 medical emergencies did we have to go back and give them antibiotics. The, the test was a very useful one for identifying whether infection was present or not. We also did that in, with intensive care patients. Sometimes it's very hard to tell whether they're developing an infection. Uh, their requirements for ventilation might change a bit, and is that due to infection or not? So again, we use this biomarker to help us make that decision. And in no cases did we have to go back and give them, uh, give them antibiotics from patients we, we'd withheld antibiotics. So we actually saved about half the volume of antibiotics that we would have used otherwise. We looked also at mortality to make sure we weren't killing patients by doing this. Uh, and there were six patients on the medical emergency unit who died in the course of this project, but none of the deaths were infection related. There were also some patients on intensive care who died in the course of this evaluation, but all actually had infections and were receiving antibiotics anyway. We hadn't withheld any antibiotics on those. So we don't think we caused any harm by uh, measuring this biomarker. So um, the use of this suggested much better, uh, a scope for much better tailoring of antibiotic use. There's Dr. Wimbush and uh, his team on intensive care with a, with a patient who was uh, in the evaluation. So we've done some quite uh, high-tech things, but we've also done some very simple things. One of our infection control uh, colleagues, um, Linda Swanson, one of the infection control nurses, did an audit of patients who got pneumonia in hospital. And by and large, uh, she established that it was probably because they were aspirating their own uh, uh, fluid from their throat. Uh, and so she did a very simple measure, raising the, the bed by 30 degrees and showed a dramatic reduction in hospital-acquired pneumonia, a really simple intervention that, called, that, that, that resulted in a, in, in a, in a major uh, quality improvement. We've also done some work on non-antibiotic treatments in patients who might otherwise receive antibiotics. So we've done some projects and are still doing those on something called surgery honey. So it's a honey dressing, natural dressing, non-antibiotic related obviously, uh, but it's bioengineered to, to give it more antimicrobial power. Uh, and this is a patient with very severe peripheral vascular disease, blockage of his peripheral arteries, uh, and he was rapidly heading for a leg amputation because of the severity of his uh, you know, poor blood supply to his lower leg. He's got a big ulcer that's heavily colonised with a nasty bug called Pseudomonas. We could have given him antibiotics, but I suspect all that would have done would have been to select out a multi-resistant organism. So we tried surgery honey. And you can see by day four, it's changed colour. It's sort of greenish up there. It's now lime green down here. 
and you can almost hear the pseudomonases screaming as they uh, are being attacked by the surgery honey. But by day eight, the colour is completely gone, and in fact the culture was negative by the stage. The pseudomonas is gone, uh, and the wound is nice and granulating underneath, uh, and he was actually able to go home without an amputation. So there was, there was quite a bit of healing as well. So we're still doing a lot of work on that, uh, and that's a very interesting project. So th these are my final two slides, and uh, again, it summarises what I think we need to do in the world, which is uh, quite a tall order, really, but we can do our own little bit here and try and evangelise and persuade other people around the world to, uh, uh, to follow our example. But if you look at the, these arrows, that the width of the arrows um, relate to the strength of that process. So, for example, very thin arrow for antibiotic discovery, because there's very little antibiotics being discovered. There's a very thick arrow for antibiotic treatment because we're all using too much antibiotic. <coughs> There's quite a thick arrow for selective pressure and resistance because in the world we're overcrowded, we've, uh, we've got intensive livestock rearing, we've got sewage going into the rivers, not necessarily in, in Winchester I hope, but you know around the world, and all that creates a nice primeval soup for the selection of resistance. And all of those get into us, <coughs> into patients. And in the world, we've got very poor public health, uh, you know, as they had in Soho in, in the 1860s at the last cholera epidemic there. Uh, elsewhere in the world, the, uh, the, the public health is of the same order. So a narrow arrow for that. What we've got to do is reverse all those arrows. So we need to develop uh, new antibiotics. We need to reduce the volume of antibiotic use. We need to improve public health. And we need to dramatically reduce the, uh, the selection pressure. I think if we can persuade everybody in the world to do that, then that will be fantastic. And although it seems a tall order, you may remember in the last Commonwealth Games, um, we, in the UK, we published uh, a paper on the New Delhi E. coli, uh, a highly resistant E. coli that came back with people who'd been to New Delhi for the Commonwealth Games. The Indian government whoa, went in uproar. They started blaming the British for, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for slagging yeah. off their, uh, their health service and uh, the fact that the British were jealous because they had a very effective health service and the British were going over there for health tourism. And they said, you know, it was absolute rubbish, all this business about uh, a multi-resistant organism. But uh, it, that was the government. But the doctors in India recognised it. And they've now had the Chennai Declaration, which is an amazing achievement in India, to bring together all health professionals to look at exactly this problem. So, you know, India's making huge strides in, in, in changing the whole environment. Uh, and if we can get the, the other countries in the world to do that, that would be fantastic. So it's just a question of, you know, uh, keep uh, sounding the message, really. So I'll stop there. I'm very happy to try and answer any questions if there are any. <laughs>